It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for. Stop the clock. Since you decided you want to start, we're starting with warnings. And I will immediately use them. Please start. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the government had an opportunity to apologize for their latest attack on the. Minister of Finance is warned. Speaker, clearly the government doesn't like to talk about the Auditor General's report. Right. Now, instead of doing the right thing and supporting our motion yesterday, they voted it down. I want to give the Liberals another chance. To the Minister of Energy, will the government apologize to the Auditor General for what was a blatant attempt to discredit right. her office? It wasn't right. They know it wasn't right, and they should apologize. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy birthday. Thank you for the birthday wishes. Mr. Speaker, I remember March 2nd very well. That was the day on which our government announced the Fair Hydro Plan, which has lowered electricity bills by an average of 25 per cent for all residential customers and as half a million small businesses and farms. That was 237 days ago. Mr. Speaker. The member from Huron, Bruce, is warned. I mean, sorry. Bruce, well, I'm thinking Bruce. I'm a little backwards today. Bruce Gray Owen Sound is warned. That was 237 days ago, Mr. Speaker, and shortly after that, the Leader of the Official Opposition promised to release his own energy plan sometime in the coming weeks. But here we are, Mr. Speaker, over a half a year later, almost yes, halfway sir. through the fall session, and in those 237 days, a lot has happened, Mr. Speaker, but nothing has happened on that side. Oh, That's the party you. that should be apologizing for both. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, the question was about the way this government has discredited right. the Auditor General. Right. The Auditor General said the way they're doing this hydro scheme will cost Ontarians four billion dollars more than necessary. And I get that it's the Liberal talking uh, points today to applaud the Minister of Energy, but what we're talking about is four billion dollars that Ontario families are going to have to pay because of this government. And rather than acknowledge the Auditor General's report and say we're going to try to fix this, they discredit the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, 10 times out of 10, if I'm chose choose who to believe, the Auditor General or this Liberal government, I'm going to choose the Auditor General. So I will ask the question again. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Energy apologize to the Auditor General for the way question. his office, his ministry, has discredited her office? Yeah. Yeah. You please? You it, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue to work with the Auditor General. We, as the President of the Treasury Board says, 99.9% .9 of the time, we always agree with the Auditor General and implement her recommendations. In this instance, Mr. Speaker, we agree that this is an accounting dispute. We have KPMG, we have ENY, we have Deloitte. All of these peers of the Auditor General agree. What we have brought forward, Mr. Speaker, is a plan that is going to actually reduce rates by 25% and meet the Canadian public sector accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. But I know the point is, Mr. Speaker, that the Conservatives are refusing or even unable to come up with any ideas or a plan of their own, Mr. Speaker. We've helped families by lowering their rates by 25 per cent. We've helped families by raising the minimum wage yes, to $15. We protect tenants from unfair rent increases. What do they have on that side, Mr. Speaker? Yeah, thank you. Zero. Final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, I'm glad that the Minister is now saying he agrees with the Auditor General because the Auditor General has said their energy policy is a house of cards, that after the election, energy rates are going to skyrocket. The Auditor General has said they make up their own rules. The Auditor General has said they're going to blow $4 billion unnecessarily. So if you're all of a sudden agreeing with the Auditor General, how are you going to fix that problem and not simply discredit her? You know, Mr. Speaker, yesterday it was written in an article, the Minister of Energy went so far Far, the ministry went so as far as to personally contact journalists the day before her report was released to say the Auditor General's interpretation is flawed. Calling the day before the report to discredit the Auditor General? That's not working with the Auditor Great. General. That's attacking the Auditor General. So once again, will the government Question. do the right thing and apologize to the Auditor General? You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. Minister? Again, Mr. Speaker, we continue to work with the Auditor General on an ongoing basis. We will continue as a government to be open and transparent with the Auditor General and with all independent officers of the House, Mr. Speaker. It is important for us to continue to have that working dialogue. As the President of the Treasury Board has said over and over again, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to do so. This is an accounting dispute, Mr. Speaker. We believe, and so do her peers, and so do all of the um, uh, bureaucracy accountants, all believe that the way that we have done this by keeping the assets of the electricity system in that sector, Mr. Speaker, meets with the Canadian public sector accounting standards. We'll continue to work forward, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to advocate for the people of this province, unlike the opposition, which Answer. has nothing on offer and never will, Mr. Speaker. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. The Liberals, according to the Auditor General, have been accused of making up their own accounting rules. Let me repeat, making up their own accounting rules. What worries me is what else they may be hiding, Mr. Speaker. They seem to be making up their own record retention rules on the fly. They certainly don't seem to be keen on releasing emails to the Auditor General. We are still waiting on those, so here is another chance. Since they don't want to apologize to the Auditor General for this blatant attempt to discredit the independent legislative officer, at the very least, will they do what they said they'd do, be transparent, release the email, stop hiding 99 per cent of those emails. Will they do the right thing and release the emails requested? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's, uh, it is our government's commitment to continue to work with uh, the Auditor General, to continue to be open and transparent, and we're going to continue to cooperate with their office. Now, it's important for me to say, Mr. Speaker, that I've just been, been informed by my ministry that as of Monday, October 23rd, the ministry has provided 30,126 records to the Auditor General. That's in addition to the 1,200 from the ISO, um, the hundreds from OPG, the over 3,000 from the Ontario Financing Authority, the Treasury Board. I know the President of the Treasury Board and the Treasury Board have provided thousands of records, Mr. Speaker. And additionally, the Ministry has told me that we're continuing to release additional information to the Auditor General, and we're doing this, Mr. Speaker, because we understand the importance of providing the Auditor with everything that she's asked for, and the Ministry will continue to regularly Answer. provide the Auditor General um, with additional responsive documents each week until this process is uh, finished, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy said, I quote, he doesn't expect a ticker tape parade for how the Liberals handled the hydrophile. Well, that's a stretch. That's, that's certainly no surprise. They can't line up for a parade because they're lining up for food banks right now in Ontario and unemployment insurance. People can't afford to pay their hydro bills. People are living in energy poverty. And right now, the Liberals... Minister of Agriculture is warned. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, right now the Liberals laugh when I say people are living in energy poverty, but the more I travel in this province, the more I hear examples of people who are struggling, beyond struggling, to pay their hydro bill. It's not a laughing matter. And this latest $4 billion is just the cherry on the top of their hydro crisis, a crisis that you created, a crisis this government created. So my question, question. is, when are we going to get meaningful hydro relief, not more spin? When are we actually going to get meaningful hydro relief for the families that you're laughing at right Thank now? You.
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's obvious they'll never get any relief under that party that has no idea what to do and no plan, Mr. Speaker. It's ridiculous that they continue to come up and shake their fist and talk about doing something for the people of Ontario, but instead they vote against real relief. Real relief, Mr. Speaker, is 25 per cent off every single household in this province. They voted against it. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we announced a $100 million affordability fund. This is going to help tens of thousands of people in this province. You know who voted against that, Mr. Speaker? That member and that party. You know what, Mr. Speaker? We know that the only people that are lining up to see something are their members to find out what they're going to do. They have no idea, Mr. Speaker. We have talked about things that we have been doing in the 237 days that they've offered nothing. We are introducing a minimum wage increase, Mr. Speaker. They voted against. Prescriptions, all prescriptions for people 25 and under, Mr. Speaker, they voted against. The only people that are waiting in line are people to watch what they Thank do, you. Mr. Speaker. And I stand, you sit, Minister. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, deleting emails is not a plan. Borrowing is not a plan. Hiding debt is not a plan. The relief that Ontario families want, they are, they are not getting. And the government spin about this latest $4 billion they're wasting, that spin doesn't add up. The government continues to tout that accounting firms support this Liberal scheme. What they failed to mention is that the government hired those firms. They contract out to get the answers they want. They are beholden to the government. The Auditor General is not. She isn't in the pocket of the Liberals. We get the truth from the Auditor General. Well, the taxpayers foot the bills for millions for Liberal spin. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is very specific, and hopefully I can get an answer. How much did the Liberals spend to fight the Auditor General's report? How many dollars did you put into this big spin? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's appalling is the Leader of the Opposition will sully the names of world-class yep. organizations like KPMG, wow. like Deloitte, like e &Y. I know all Conservatives from the past are rolling over in their grave, Mr. Speaker, to hear that coming from that party. You know, at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we've ensured that we've talked with world-class organizations that have looked at our accounting standards, Mr. Speaker. The government standards are prepared in accordance with the public sector accounting standards and will continue to follow these standards for the transactions resulting from the Fair Hydro Plan in 2017 and 2018 and in future years, Mr. Speaker. In re uh, relation to rate-regulated uh, accounting, PSAC is silent and does not prohibit the use of rate-regulated accounting. Maybe that party should actually do a little yes, research sir. and talk with some of these firms before they accuse them of what he just did, Mr. Speaker. That is shameful. Thank you. New question, the member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Acting Premier. Every day, we hear horror stories from vulnerable seniors and their families about what they are going through in long-term care homes across the province. Conditions are putting our seniors at risk, and we have a wait list in Ontario that tops 32,000 people. Now we hear that there are as many as 14 homes in Toronto looking to pick up and move. Can the Acting Premier tell us, since the Minister of Health has to personally approve any proposal for a home to relocate, will she promise right now that none of these homes will be allowed to leave the city? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We, uh, we appreciate the hard work that the operators of our long-term care homes across this province do. The not-for-profit homes, the municipal homes, the for-profit homes, collectively, they are absolutely committed to providing the highest quality care for their residents. Uh, and that includes here in Toronto. Mr. Speaker, I can say categorically that we have not received uh, any applications from the 20 long-term care uh, homes that were referenced uh, in the media over the past couple of days. We have not received, the ministry has not received, uh, I have uh, not received any applications or proposals that entertain or suggest or would even imply that beds 
uh, and homes in Toronto would be anywhere else but in Toronto, Mr. Speaker. And we have very good examples yes, of how successful redevelopment is happening in the City of Toronto, and I'm happy to speak to that in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. The well-being of 1,800 seniors is up in the air right now. Families are worried they may not be able to visit their parents or grandparents as often as they need. Seniors have loved ones, friends, doctors, and many other ties to the cities. They need the Premier's word that no home in Toronto will be allowed to relocate away from their neighbourhoods under her watch. Will the acting Premier give residents of long-term care and their families that comfort? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, uh, not only have I received no applications, uh, but uh, I personally, in writing, have to approve uh, every new redevelopment, whether that is even within the same community, in the same location, Mr. Speaker, but certainly I need to approve it in writing. And certainly when it comes to uh, moving or any proposals to moving the, uh, beds from a location, the first step that I take upon review and with the advice of the ministry is to send it back to the community to have a fulsome community conversation and consultation overseen by the ministry and by the LIN so we can have a clear understanding of the importance of those beds of that home in that community. Community. I have worked tirelessly across the province, not just in Toronto, to ensure that those beds and those homes do remain in the communities where they are, and I will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The fact that relocation is even a consideration for these homes just goes to show how much the government is willing to ignore the problems that face our long-term care home system. I'm sure the Premier and her Minister of Health have had many many meetings with home directors, staff, long-term care associations, and families with loved ones in care. They must have heard many times by many different people, and not just opposition members like myself, about the state of our long-term care system. Has the Premier just chosen to ignore these concerns, or is she that out of touch with the needs of our vulnerable seniors in the province of Ontario? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, here's who's out of touch. It's that party. Because, Mr. Speaker, here they go again. I was absolutely categorical yesterday in saying no applications whatsoever have come forward to the ministry or to me that suggests anything of what they are doing. They are fear-mongering once again. They are instilling fear in the residents and the families of those long-term care homes. And I certainly hope, Mr. Speaker, that what they're that they are not suggesting that those homes should not be redeveloped, because those homes need to be redeveloped to, to provide that highest quality of care. Okay. I have to approve every single bed transfer home redevelopment. I am working tirelessly across the province, including Toronto, but I am not fear-mongering, and I am not suggesting, Answer. as they are, that these individuals, these residents, should be afraid because they can be assured that I will work Thank to you. maintain those beds here. Thank you. Thank you. Do you see the please? Do you see the please? Thank you. New question. My question is back. From London Fanshawe. When the health minister gets that defensive, you know you've hit a nerve. Speaking for long-term care homes. Sorry. No, 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 no. The member will identify who the question is for, please. I did, Speaker, but I'll speak up. To the acting premier, long-term care homes in Toronto and across the province are struggling partially because of the Liberal government's failure to keep its promise to redevelop 35,000 long-term care beds. Ten years ago. The Liberals promised to update these beds, but 2014, they have only completed 5,000. The Minister of Health confirmed yesterday that 13,500 beds have now been redeveloped. Does the Premier plan to keep her Liberal government's promise and complete the other 21,500 by December 31st, no. or were the 35,000 be beds just another stretch goal? Thank you. 
Deputy Premier. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely committed to redeveloping 30,000 beds across this province. We have already redeveloped 13,500 of those beds. Wow. And we're working with organizations such as Rakai here in Toronto to give that example where they are redeveloping a Toronto long-term care home in downtown Toronto, in fact, in the West Donlands. Not-for-profit in downtown Toronto, a new redevelopment, 220 beds, a specialized unit for those with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, a whole host of supported care, supportive care surrounding that, right across the road from the Answer. Y, Mr. Speaker. It is a fantastic example of what can be done when proponents and operators work together with the Lynn and the Ministry of Health for Thank redevelopment, you. including in downtown Toronto. The Premier's stubborn refusal to even consider expanding the scope of the wet law for inquiry into long-term care means that broken promises like this one can be swept under the rug. I guess if that's convenient with her, for, the, her, for the Premier when an election is on the horizon, but seniors in the province deserve better. Seniors, seniors deserve a government committed to finding and fixing each and every issue that threatens their well-being. When will the Premier show Ontario seniors and their loved ones the respect they deserve and agree to expand the scope of the wet law for inquiry? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, this, uh, let me do this. Redevelop beds, 13,500 in Ontario already, including 63 at Chateau Gardens in London, 170 at Extendicare in London, 60 at Bursa Care Elmwood Place in London, 243 at Deerness Home in London, 141 at McCormick Home in London, and in fact, an additional 19 at McCormick Home in London. 157 at McGarrow Place in London, 32 at Kensington Village in London, an additional 80 at Kensington in London, and an additional 16 and an additional 32 at Kensington, different phases in London, Mr. Speaker. There is a long list here of 13,500, but I hope the member would agree. I don't think she's suggesting either Answer. that we should redevelop, it, we'd redevelop or that we're not redeveloping in her city, because we are. Yes, yes. Final supplementary. Speaker, in the long list of numbers, the minister forgot to add 32,000 people waiting on a waiting yeah, list yeah. long term care. How about that number? How about that number? Twenty-one thousand five hundred beds have yet to be redeveloped by this government. There is a severe shortage of frontline staff. We've heard horror stories of neglect and abuse regularly from every corner of this province, and there are 14 homes in Toronto that may leave the city. If a broad inquiry that will find and fix the systemic issues in our long-term care homes isn't what the Premier thinks we need, what is her plan to make sure that our parents, our grandparents are able to live their golden years with dignity? Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Toronto, 192 redeveloped beds at Kipling Acres, Mr. Speaker. 98 redeveloped beds at True Davidson Acres. 108 redeveloped beds at Copernicus Lodge. 89 redeveloped beds again at True Davidson Acres. 88 redeveloped beds at Vermont Square. 174 redeveloped beds at Chester Village and 29 additional beds at Chester Village in Toronto. What the NDP is doing here is they're fear-mongering, they're inciting fear among residents of our long-term care homes, and that's not to say we don't have specific instances where improvements need to be made, and we are addressing those through inspections and restrictions on admission and other important measures, punitive measures, 
but to suggest that the situation is anything close to what they are is reprehensible, Mr. Speaker. No question. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. According to Life Sciences Ontario, the innovative pharma sector invests over $1 billion in research and development each year. They contribute over $3.8 billion to the Canadian economy each year, and approximately 45 per cent of that investment is directed within Ontario. Life Sciences Ontario sector report from 2015 noted the pharmaceutical sector contributes 12,800 indirect jobs and 7,700 direct jobs in Ontario. We understand that these investments are currently at risk. There are impacts from the proposed federal changes to the Patent Medicines Pricing Review Board that could directly impact the research investment and associated jobs in Ontario. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is what is the province doing to ensure these investments and jobs stay in Ontario? Have they contacted their federal counterparts? And what assurances do we have for these, these jobs question. in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister for Economic Development and Growth uh, will uh, want to take the supplementary, but <laughs> on this issue of pharma, I want to say that we had last week our Federal Provincial Territorial Health Minister's meeting, and due to the leadership of our Premier and the leadership of Ontario, we were able to have discussions, fulsome discussions, on the Thursday and on the Friday, in fact, breakfast as well on the Friday morning, that we're wholly uh, about the issue of pharma and about creating a strong pharmaceutical industry, but most importantly, steps to take for national pharma care. And in fact, all health ministers, every province, every territory, and the federal health minister agreed now to get down to the work to scope out what a wow. national pharma care program Answer. would look like in terms of timelines wow. and costs and the framework, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of that work. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, my hope was that the question I asked could be answered. Uh, a different question uh, was clearly may, may, maybe someone misheard what I said, but Mr. Speaker, what I was asking about is the proposed federal changes to the Patent Medicines Pricing Review Board. 7,700 direct jobs in Ontario. This is significant investment. These are important, well-paying jobs we want to protect in the province of Ontario. So again to the minister, uh, during these discussions they had with the health ministers and the federal government, did you get assurances that these proposals, uh, what accommodation is there going to be for Ontario? How do we protect the jobs here? And Mr. Speaker, um, if you're not concerned about the new federal regulations, um, explain to this House why these changes aren't going to affect the province of Ontario. Th these are jobs we have to protect here. To the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Of Economic well, Mr. Development Speaker, we and agree. Growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We agree that we need to to uh, protect those jobs here, and we, we need we agree that we need to stand up for jobs in our innovation economy, Mr. Speaker. That's why this government worked so hard when Mars was having challenges to invest in Mars. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? What kind of help did we have from the other side? They tried to shoot down every effort we ever made to build up our innovation economy in this province at Mars. Mr. Speaker, just last week, we announced something that's very, very important to this sector. The most important thing we can do for our innovation sector, Mr. Speaker, is to build that pipeline of young talent that we're providing in this province. We're providing those companies with the best talent anywhere in North America today. Last week, we announced that we're going to be extending by 25 per cent the talent available to this sector in the STEM uh, area, Mr. Speaker. We look for Answer. And what have we heard from the, from the party opposite? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker. They're nowhere on energy, they're nowhere on the minimum Thank wage, you. and they're nowhere when it comes to the new Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. This government keeps insisting that it must spend an extra $4 billion on a complicated alternative financing scheme because it is the only way to keep ratepayer and taxpayer costs separate. But nearly 20 years ago, the government established the Ontario Electricity Financial Corporation. It was established as a way to separate 
taxpayer and ratepayer funds. The problem for this government is the OF OEFC debt stays on the government's books, and this government wants to keep deficits and debt off the books to make the Liberal Party look better. Will the government admit that it is wasting $4 billion in ratepayer money for no other purpose than to help the Liberal Question. Party? The Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and talk about the policy decision that we made as a government. Mr. Speaker, we all know that the Fair Hydro Plan is actually reducing the rates by 25 per cent for every single household in this province and for 500,000 small businesses and farms. Mr. Speaker, that policy decision made sure that we actually looked at where the assets where the borrowing was coming from, and then made sure that the borrowing stayed within the electricity system. We actually did pull costs from the rate base and put it onto the tax base, Mr. Speaker. Those were the social programs. The Affordability Fund, which we announced yesterday, Mr. Speaker, which is a $100 million fund, which is going to help tens and thousands of tens of thousands of more people in this yes, province with their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work for the people of Ontario and continue to provide the relief that we know that they wanted and asked for. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Speaker, the government could have used normal public sector accounting to achieve exactly the same policy goals, and it would have cost ratepayers $4 billion less. It could have used the OEFC to administer the program and keep ratepayer and taxpayer funds separate. The only use, the only reason to use this $4 billion alternative financing trick is to hide the true cost of the government's hydro borrowing scheme from the public. The only reason. Will the government help ratepayers instead of the Liberal Party and stop this needless waste of $4 billion today? Minister, Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In, in regards to the OEFC, it is still involved. And as the member may or may not know, during our recent transaction to broaden the ownership of Hydro One, it paid down OEFC debt in order to, again, accommodate uh, our, our work. Furthermore, we inherited a stranded debt of almost $28 billion from the opposition, which was not a marketable opportunity, unlike what is happening here in this instance. And, Mr. Speaker, as we proceed forward, we are taking a proportionate amount off the tax base and we've taken a proportionate amount off the rate base, as is normal under these circumstances. Mr. Speaker, OEFC is engaged and it's doing its part. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. This spring, our government took a big step forward in ensuring that our clean and reliable electricity is affordable to everyone in Ontario. The cost of electricity had become a concern for many communities, and I know the people in Ontario were eager to see the government take action. The Fair Hydro Plan passed last session is a 25 per cent reduction on average for all households in this province. No loopholes, no exceptions, just the significant relief for this important household expense. But that wasn't all. The government also included new and expanded support programs for low-income Ontarians, sure. as well as a program to help those with the highest delivery charges in Ontario. Additionally, we introduced a new program Question. called the Affordability Fund. Could the minister please update us on what this program does and when it will begin to support Ontario Thank families? you. Mr. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member from Barrie for that question and, of course, Mr. Speaker, for her tireless work for uh, her constituents in that area, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted to update the members on the launch of the Affordability Fund, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I was in Hamilton to announce this exciting new program. The Affordability Fund is designed to help people improve in energy efficiency of their homes while reducing their bills and their carbon footprint, Mr. Speaker. The new $100 million fund will support the free installation of energy-saving LED light bulbs, power bars, uh, improved insulation, energy-efficient uh, air conditioners, refrigerators, and many more pieces of equipment, Mr. Speaker. The Affordability Fund is designed to help people who do not qualify for low-income conservation programs on 
and who are unable to undertake energy efficiency improvements without support. Yes, this fund, managed by the, an independent trust, is being supported by Hydro One, and I want to thank that leadership team thank for their you. vision. We're going to continue to focus on helping the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answer. This program is welcome news for the families in my riding who need extra help with their electricity bills. I'm pleased that our government is taking action to support those that don't have the means to pay for household upgrades. In addition to cutting residential hydro bills by 25 per cent on average through the Fair Hydro Plan, we are delivering even more savings to Ontario families through the Affordability Fund. I heard you say many times in this House that for every dollar spent on conservation programs, we save $2. That's a very wise investment. Completely By providing right. electricity customers with the tools to improve the energy efficiency of their homes, we're helping reduce pressure on their pocketbooks and protecting the environment. Minister, can you please explain how electricity consumers can sign up for this program? Question. Thank you. Minister. Uh, the, the good question. Yes, Electricity sir. consumers can find out if they are eligible for the program by going to the program's website, affordabilityfund.org. Uh, on this website, electricity consumers can see what support they may be eligible for and to sign up for this program, Mr. Speaker. Whether you rent or own, live in a house or an apartment, you may qualify for more savings on your electricity bill. Electricity bill savings for households participating in the program will obviously depend, Mr. Speaker, on the types of measures installed, but a home Home energy kit with two LED light bulbs and a power bar can help save about 10 bucks, Mr. Speaker. Energy efficient uh, refrigerator can help about save about $90 in annual electricity costs. I encourage all members, uh, constituents who are looking to make energy efficiency upgrades at home who might not have the disposable income to afford these upgrades to check out the website and see if they're eligible. Yes, our government has a plan to make sure that everybody in Ontario has the opportunity to share in the growth of our economy, and measures like this plan and the Fair Hydro Plan make it more fair, Mr. Hey, Speaker. Hey. New question: The member from Haldeman Norfolk. To the Minister of Natural Resources and uh, Forestry. Uh, two years ago, I contacted your office and the Petroleum Division regarding a Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry natural gas relief well along Big Creek. Ian and Kim Grant from uh, Silver Hill are in the gallery today, and they were notified that this uh, relief well was releasing hydrogen sulfide and toxic water into Big Creek and it had to be capped. Apparently the well was capped in the 1960s, so the ramifications of this goes back five decades. Now pressure built up over two years with another well erupting this June on the Grant's property, plus another well down the road after MNRF assured the Grant's and my office that they would be monitoring the problem. The grants have suffered damage to their business, their property, possibly their health. Minister, Question. why has it taken so long to act? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And I want to uh, uh, start off by saying that public health and public safety is really our government's and our ministry's sole focus in this area. We know that there are abandoned wells along uh, the, the shores of uh, Lake Erie, for instance, and in the other areas that need um, recapping. So I know that the place that the member is talking about, we were notified early on. We expedited the process to ensure that ministry officials were there to provide advice to the municipality and ensured that the, uh, the well was being uh, capped. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry always can provide technical advice to support any municipality. We'll be continuing to work with the municipal control group to assess the situation Answer. and determine the next steps. We again want to ensure the public that public safety is my ministry's top priority. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. It was two years going on five decades, really, with little action in August. Norfolk County and the Holloman Norfolk Health Unit stepped in. They closed roads, they evacuated the grants, they evacuated five other families in the area. Finally, the wells have been capped, but the question is, what is the minister doing to ensure history does not repeat itself? Again, what about these environmental impacts, possible health effects? 
Will you compensate Norfolk County? Importantly, and again, for loss of business, for damage to plant and equipment, health, why won't you compensate Kim and Ian Grant? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. We continue to work with the municipality and the local health units, but I, I do understand how distressing it is for individuals to have to be either evacuated from their home or have impacts to, to their uh, businesses or their homes because of that. Uh, recently, we continue to um, look at uh, areas across um, areas where there are potential wells that will need to be capped. In the coming months, my ministry will be reaching out to municipalities to discuss the planning and the emergency management scenarios related to petroleum hazards and risks. This is a multi-government approach, and we continue to provide technical advice in these situations. The education Answer. and outreach work will help to clarify roles and responsibilities to allow municipalities to plan ahead by better understanding the risks. So we will continue to provide that advice. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The government talks a lot about investing in child care. However, current policy and promises are not backed up by action. Case in point, organizations like Al Child Care Services in Waterloo Region are left asking, where's the money? Al is opening a new child care centre, and the Government of Ontario promised to pay for the capital costs, including furniture and equipment. Al has now been told by this government that there isn't enough money for the furniture or the equipment. Child care spaces in my community are at risk because of chronic underfunding, and families are left to pay the price through higher fees, child care fees. Will the Acting Premier commit to providing the promised funding to our child care services in Waterloo Region? Uh, thank you. The Minister of Early Years and Child Care. The Minister responsible for Early Years and Child Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for this important question. Speaker, I want you to know that absolutely we are doing everything we can to make sure that we are transforming the way we deliver childcare, and part of that promise and that pledge is to make sure we're moving funding forward. So right now we have increased funding. We are now moving funding forward to $1.4 billion when it comes to operating costs. In addition, we've moved forward with an extra $200 million. We have also moved forward and are taking uh, applications right now for $1.6 billion in capital expenditures and costs. Uh, so we are building actual spaces. But what I'm trying to say is that the money is moving forward. We don't directly fund childcare centres. What we do is fund municipalities, and we leave those decisions to the local district service managers to decide where that money goes and where the yes, allocations sir. go. And so I would uh, be more than happy to look into this instance of what is going on, but I think uh, it would uh, be advisable for the group Thank to you. loop in with the local district manager. Supplementary. Again to the Acting Premier, people in this province, whether they are college faculty or early childhood educators, deserve equal pay for equal work. In Ontario, two ECEs with the same education and the same qualification can receive vastly different wages. If they work for a school board, they can make up to $30 an hour, but if they choose to work in a licensed community childcare, they may make as little as $11.25 an hour. Many ECEs don't even have enough money or make enough money in the system to put their own children into the child care centres that they work in. In Ontario, we need good jobs. We need fair wages for everyone, including ECEs, which is, I must point out, a predominantly fem uh, female-oriented field. Why won't the government commit to providing early child educators with equal pay for equal work in the province Question. of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. As speaker, I'm proud to rise today and speak about this uh, issue, especially since it is Child Care Worker and ECE Appreciation Day. And I want to thank the uh, workers who are here today for being right here with us at Queen's Park. 
You know, uh, child care workers and ECEs play a critical role in our child care system. They provide children across Ontario with a strong foundation in learning to help them get the best possible start in life. And absolutely, the need for better wages and compensation for these early years in child care workforce is uh, something that we heard throughout our consultations and is a priority for this government. And so that's why we're doing so many things, uh, Speaker, on so many different levels. So absolutely, we've raised the minimum wage from 11 to going to $14 an hour starting in January. Many of the uh, child care workers out there are making minimum Answer. wage. We also are bringing in a workforce strategy, which is looking to do a deeper dive. We also have a wage enhancement of $188 million to take up the hour. Thank you. Your question? The member from Carleton, Mississippi Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, Ontario electricity costs are the highest in almost all of North America. The Unfair Green Energy Act provides massive subsidy payments from Ontario ratepayers to out-of-province wind and solar electricity producers for electricity that we do not even need. We do this while we shut down Ontario water and nuclear-produced electricity that costs six cents per kilowatt hour. The Green Energy Act is impoverishing Ontario homeowners. It is driving businesses and jobs out of Ontario. The Green Energy Act has reduced the once prosperous Ontario to a have-not province. Minister, it is time to show respect for the people of Ontario. Will you do the right thing and repeal the Green Energy Act? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member for the question. When it comes to the first part of his question, Mr. Speaker, we have dropped rates by 25 per cent, and I know the honourable member knows that because the constituents in his riding will have seen a reduction of 25 per cent on their bills. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to renewable energy, this sector has created tens of thousands of jobs in our province, creating uh, economic benefits for communities from Actually, Windsor to Ottawa to Sudbury to Sault Ste. Marie, all the way up into the northern part of our province, into Thunder Bay and right across up there, Mr. Speaker, into Kenora and elsewhere. The Green Energy Act, Mr. Speaker, has brought forward about 18,000 megawatts of renewable power to our province, Mr. Speaker. Sorry. These megawatts are actually making sure that we have a diverse supply mix, a supply mix that has Answer. made sure that we no longer have to worry about smog days in this province, which is a savings again to our health care system and to the benefits Thank of you. all people in this province. Supplementary. Again, to the Minister of Energy. The Green Energy Act has cost Ontario people billions of dollars. First, with the sole source contract for $7 billion with Samsung, and then with countless out of province subsidized wind and solar contracts. Could you have chosen, you could have chosen to buy water powered electricity from Quebec. It would have been cheap. It would have been as required instead of as produced. It would have been Canadian. It would have been a good deal. If your objective was to redistribute Ontario wealth to other nations and to lower our standard of living in order to reduce consumption of resource, resources, as preached by Maurice Strong and his Agenda 21, then I applaud you. You have been successful. Why did you choose the most expensive plan possible? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, pleased to rise and, and talk about the system that we've built in Ontario. It now benefits from a 90% emissions-free electricity system. It is clean and it is green, Mr. Speaker, and it will allow the, the trillium flowers to grow in this province from the honourable member on that side, Mr. Speaker. You know, since 2003, Ontario's clean energy initiatives have attracted billions of dollars in private sector investment, generating over uh, 42,000 jobs at uh, over 30 solar and wind manufacturers operating in communities across the province. Ontario ranks first for installed wind capacity in this country, Mr. Speaker, and renewables were an important element of our government's plan to close all of Ontario's coal plants by 2014, Mr. Answer. Speaker. That year, Ontario became the first jurisdiction in North America to fully eliminate cold fire electricity generation, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. 
Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the minister responsible for early years and childcare. Uh. As the members of this house know, today marks the 17th annual Child Care Worker and Early Childhood Educator Appreciation Day, and I want to welcome all the ECE workers that have joined us here today. It is important that we recognize the hard work and value of those who are shaping and caring for our youngest learners. And as a mother of two young boys, I know how important this is. And it's equally as important to make sure we retain the hardworking professionals who are already doing this crucial job. And Speaker, let me give a shout out to all the great ECE workers in Davenport. Exactly. They are the front lines of our children's path through education. Can the minister tell me more about what she is doing to help recruit and retain early childhood education? educators in Ontario. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Davenport for this very important question. Yeah. Speaker, we are creating a strong foundation for our young children so they can thrive, and we're investing in the people who work hard every day to provide high-quality licensed childcare programs for Ontario kids. Included in our framework to build quality, affordable, accessible childcare is our commitment to develop a workforce strategy to support Ontario's early years in childcare professionals. It's so important, Speaker. Support in key areas like compensation, professional development, hiring, retention, and education. That work is underway. We also announced that the government is going to host two professional development events a year, starting in 2018. And we're creating regional centers of excellence for early years and child care educators. Speaker, with our five-year expansion Answer. plan, it's estimated we're going to need 20,000 more ECEs. The work is underway, and we're doing everything we can to recruit. Thank you. Supplementary. And thank you to the minister for that answer. And I've heard from many ECEs that they are concerned about the low wages in the field and worry they may not be able to pay for their expenses, including their own family's childcare needs. It is true that average salaries for ECEs have increased over the past five years, but they are still lower than the average salary, making recruitment and retention of ECEs difficult for childcare operators. For someone who is pursuing their passion of being an ECE, this can be discouraging. And as we just heard from the minister, we plan to increase the number of ECEs here in Ontario. So can the minister tell me what is being done to address wage concerns and ensure we retain those who are pursuing this important career choice? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to answer the member's question. Speaker, I've heard about the challenges ECEs face when it comes to low wages. That's why we're investing in the prof professionals who work tirelessly to deliver high-quality child care programs. In fact, our government is supporting a wage enhancement for eligible professionals working in licensed child care because this help is vital for these workers. So for 2017, we allocated more than $188 million to support the wage enhancement and the home Child Care Enhancement Grant. Just think about that. Eligible staff and home child care providers can now receive a wage enhancement of up to $2 an hour plus 17.5 per cent in benefits. An eligible home child care provider could receive a grant of up to $20 a day. Through the wage enhancement, this new job creation, we can help close the wage Answer. gap between RCECs and other child care program staff. Speaker, these investments are part of Ontario's plan to modernize child care. Thank you. And the question the member from Bruce Gray Owens South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today at Queen's Park, we have three large organizations advocating together on behalf of cancer patients: Lymphoma Canada, CanCertainty, and the Canadian Cancer Society. They are upset about Ontario's two-tiered cancer care system that forces patients to pay for life-saving medications once they leave a hospital. The unaffordability and lack of access to drugs leaves patients like Daniel Glazerman worried that his cancer may return. Mr. Speaker, you may be surprised or even outraged to hear that Ontario is lagging behind other provinces in funding cancer therapy. Will the minister please explain why he discriminates against cancer patients while Alberta, Manitoba, BC and Saskatchewan do not? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and of course, our government is absolutely committed to creating a world-class evidence-based cancer system. In fact, Ontario is a leader in cancer care, and I want to welcome CanCertainty and Canadian Cancer Society and others uh, here to Queen's Park today. In fact, Ontarians, and they know that Ontarians who get cancer, uh, they have one of the best 
chances of survival anywhere in the world, Mr. Speaker, according to the Cancer System Quality Index. But we recognize absolutely that access to cancer drugs is a critically important issue. In the last five years, we've added 68 new cancer medications. Uh, 28 of those under ODB are oral cancer drugs. And it's important to know, Mr. Speaker, that 89 percent of people, of individuals in this province who access, who require cancer medications, are seniors. Answer. That 89 percent of the population is already covered by our ODB program, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mark Silverstein lives in York Region and asked me to share his story. Mark is fighting lymphoma for the third time and is now trying venclaxta. His doctor wants to add rituxim to improve his chances, and this combination is funded in most provinces, yet rituxim is only funded for one treatment in Ontario. He was already on rituxim on an earlier regimen, so Mark is forced to pay tens of thousands of dollars for medication because this government has decided to only fund it once. Mr. Speaker, we are joined today by the renowned hematological oncologist, Dr. John Curavilla. He wants to share his frustration with Ontario's woefully deficient cancer funding. Dr. Curavilla speaks at conferences across Canada and sees firsthand the far more comprehensive cancer funding in other provinces. Will the minister please explain why Ontario Question. cancer patients are forced to pay Good out of question. pocket? Good Thank you, Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, 89 percent of the individuals that regrettably get cancer in this province are our seniors, and they're already covered for uh, both injectable and oral cancer drugs. Of the other 11 percent of the population, I'm proud to say that as of January the 1st, a significant number of those, so all children and youth up to their 25th birthday, will be absolutely and fully covered for access to oral and injectable, but oral cancer drugs absolutely free of charge no upfront fee no annual copayment no uh, no copayment no annual deductible that's a significant improvement that ability to provide child and youth pharma care takes a significant a, a movement forward to providing that coverage. But we're working closely with Cancer Care Ontario. We've established a pharmacy task force. Cancer Certainty is a member of that pharmacy task force, which, among other things, is informing us on how to further Answer. enhance the take home cancer drugs delivery model in Ontario. So we're working on this, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Cancer Unity Coalition and Canadian Cancer Society are with us at Queen's Park today, and their message is quite simple. Take-home cancer drugs have emerged as a standard treatment options for many cancer, but outside of hospital, working adults have to pay for those take-home cancer drugs the very medication that they need to get better and sometimes to stay alive. Those people are here today and they want to know what is this government going to do to help working Ontarians with cancer access the life-saving cancer drugs that they need. Thank you. Minister of Health, and Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is why it's so critically important to support Ontario's and the Premier's leadership on national pharmacare, because it provides— well, you laugh at that, but there, the NDP's plan for pharmacare didn't even include cancer drugs. Completely excluded them, Mr. Speaker. It was only 120, roughly, essential medications. So, Mr. Speaker, it's important that we work at all fronts. We're adding more oral cancer drugs, 28. They're available to our seniors, they're available to those on Ontario Works, they're available to those, those oral cancer drugs, to those on disability, and shortly, on January 1st, they're going to be available to 4 million more Ontarians who are between the age of 0 and 25, Mr. Speaker. So support us on support us at the national level on pharmacare, because universal national pharmacare will provide the answer that I believe we're Thank all you. looking for. Thank you, Speaker. Here's how it works in Ontario right now, Speaker. If the cancer treatment is given in a hospital or in a cancer treatment centre, it is free. It is publicly covered. 
But if the cancer treatment is given at home, people have to rely on private insurance, wait for months and get through the paperwork with Trillium, or pay out of their own pockets. Worrying about how to pay for medication is the last thing that a, pe a person diagnosed with cancer and their family should have to go through. Dan Glazerman, who was diagnosed with a rare form of lymphoma, and Sharon Denny, who was diagnosed with leukemia, leukemia, are here today because they want answers from this government. When will this government do something to help cover the cost of take-home cancer drugs for adults Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, 89 per cent of people in this province that get cancer are seniors. They have access to oral cancer drugs. The other 11 per cent were taking a, a massive leap forward January 1st, where anyone, 4 million more Ontarians between 0 and 25 will have access to oral cancer drugs. I hope CanCertainty and the Canadian Cancer Society and Lymphoma Society know that the NDP's Pharmacare proposal did not include cancer drugs. And so they're speaking for something that they themselves, in their own efforts, completely ignored and excluded. We're adding more oral cancer drugs. We have the Pharmacy Task Force, which CanCertainty is a member of, that is looking at us to provide us with that important advice on how we can further add more eligibility and access. Of course, we have the Trillium program as well, and we've made, together with our Answer. partners, including CanCertainty and Canadian Cancer Society, important changes to Trillium to streamline that so it's better for patients and that trillium is available for the 11 per cent of people in Ontario under 65. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, as I know, in a uh, parliamentary professional personal capacity, I'm, our government is committed to ensuring that all Ontarians have access to health care as close as, uh, to home as possible. And I want to thank the Minister of Health and the Premier uh, for the $400 million expansion that's currently going on at Etobicoke General Hospital. Whether it's new cardio, respirology, neurology, dialysis wing, you're actually doubling the footprint of Etobicoke General Amazing. Hospital. And Speaker, this is, of course, happening across the province of Ontario. Expansion and amelioration of hospitals, uh, in-home and community care, and long-term care. Notre gouvernement a annoncé an investment. Our government announced $140 million to improve our long-term care. Minister of Health, please inform this House how this $140 million investment will improve long-term health Question. care across the province. Thank you. Minister of Health, long-term well, care. Mr. Speaker, we work very closely with the Ontario Hospital Association, with Home Care Ontario, and all our stakeholders and partners in the health sector. Yes, two days ago, I announced $40 million additional dollars to be injected into the home and community care uh, service, Mr. Speaker, uh, this fiscal year, and importantly, $100 million that will go to our hospitals to create more than 2,000 beds and spaces. So we're creating 1,200 new uh, in-hospital acute care uh, beds uh, across the province, Mr. Speaker. That's the equivalent of six medium-sized hospitals that we're injecting into the hospital system. But we're doing more than that. We're providing 503 transitional spaces, including here in Toronto at the former Humber River site at Finch and the Hillcrest site here in downtown Toronto. Toronto, so that people can get out of hospital and be reactivated and make that important transition and rehabilitation yes, to get them back home quickly. And we're providing 207 affordable housing units for seniors. Together, more than 2,000 new spaces, 1,200 hospital beds that will be that we Thank work you. together with the, the hospital association. Thank you. Time for question period is over. Pursuant to standing order. 38A, the member from Hallam and Norfolk has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry concerning natural gas. This uh, natural gas wells, this matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 163, an act to enact the Safe Access to Abortion Services Act 2017 and to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in relation to abortion services. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Absolutely. All members, please take their seats. Of course. Earlier today, Mr. Nack, we moved third reading of Bill 163, an act to enact the Safe Access to Abortion Services Act 2017 to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act in relation to abortion services. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Souza, Mr. Souza, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Dugas, Mr. Dugas, Ms. McCharles, Ms. McCharles, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leal, Mr. Leal, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Cadre, Mrs. Mangas, Mrs. Mangas, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Ms. Domerle, Ms. Domerle, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassy, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Mrs. Albanese, Mrs. Albanese, Ms. McMahon, Ms. McMahon, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris, Mr. Milchin, Mr. Milchin, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Ms. Vernil, Ms. Vernil, Madame De Rosier, Madame De Rosier. Ms. McLeod, Ms. McLeod, Mr. Arna, Mr. Arna, Mr. Hardeman, Mr. Hardeman, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Yakubuski, Mr. Yakubuski, Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka, Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka, Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott, Ms. Thompson, Ms. Thompson, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, Mrs. Monroe, Mrs. Monroe, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Mrs. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Coe, Mr. Coe, Mr. Cho, Mr. Cho. Ms. Sattler, Ms. Sattler, Mr. Vantoff, Mr. Vantoff, Madame Jelena, Madame Jelena, Ms. Denovo, Ms. Denovo, Mr. Tabbins, Mr. Tabbins, Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek, Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Taylor, Mr. Natasha, Mr. Natasha, Ms. Armstrong, Ms. Armstrong, Ms. Fife, Ms. Fife, Ms. Forrester, Ms. Forrester, Ms. Ms. Shimanta, Ms. Shimanta, Mr. Hatfield, Mr. Hatfield, Mrs. Gretzky, Mrs. Gretzky, Ms. French, Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. McLaren, Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 86, the nays are 1. The ayes being 86 and the nays being 1, I declare the motion carried. Third reading the bill, resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.